One day, one moment, one miracle. The resurrection of Jesus. More than just a moment in history, but a turning point of history. A divine course correction. An event that rippled through eternity like a never-ending current, sweeping through souls of men and women who would be changed forever. A miraculous rebirth on display, waving like a banner over every person who would believe and would move from darkness to light. The resurrection of Jesus changed history, but the resurrected Jesus can change your life. What's your resurrection story? If you could imagine the United States of America without the founding fathers, it would look different. Imagine if you can, travel without the Wright brothers. I, I think it might look a little different. Imagine if you can do this, I don't know if you can, but imagine shopping without Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that long ago, it's like we had to go here and do this, and uh, imagine technology without Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, I, I mean, you, it's going to look a lot different. Anyone agree? All right, let's bring this closer to home. Imagine you're in your bathroom. Sorry, had to go there. Imagine your bathroom without Thomas Crapper. He's the guy. It's too funny to be true, but it is. He's the guy that invented the flushing toilet. So Crapper invented your Crapper. Imagine him, your bathroom experience, oh, please, Lord, let's not go there. But, but in all seriousness, and I got I to pull it back in, imagine Christianity without the resurrection, without the resurrection of Christ. What would Christianity look like? What would your individual, we're in a series, if you're visiting with us or just got started and plugged in, we're a series, Resurrection Stories. What would your resurrection story be without the resurrection? That's where we're headed. Go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Want to welcome all those joining us online. So grateful for you to be with us. Love to see you here next week. If you're in the area, man, we are doing a, th it's happening in this building, is it not? Can we praise the Lord? awesome worship experience. Come on, man. Let's praise him. Just great to be together in the house of the Lord on Sunday, worshiping him in spirit and truth. And today we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture. And I got to tell you, we're picking up where we left off last week. And what Paul does, the apostle Paul, we're going to start in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We looked at verses 1 through 11 last week. Today we're going to see Paul, he's going to get, how many people like sarcasm? You and me all. Get ready, because Paul's going to lay it on thick. And he's going to lay on the sarcasm really thick to help us understand what Christianity would be without the resurrection. So let's jump in together. First Corinthians chapter 15. Let me begin reading at verse 12. Paul writes, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that was the question. First Corinthians is a letter that was written because in Corinth at the church, there was all kinds of questions. And this is one of the letters. There was multiple letters, some of them lost letters, all trying to address specific problems that people had. This was a big one. So look what Paul says in verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We've even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. Do you see his reasoning? 
He, he's asking us, guys, guys, think this through. Then in verse 16, he says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. He's saying it again. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, underline in Christ there, that's the important thing, have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we're of all people most to be pitied. Bow your heads with me. Father, I just pray for you to help us grasp the significance of the resurrection. It's the linchpin. Without it, all the wheels fall off. And Paul wants to make it clear. And Lord, for those who are in the house, for those who are watching online, I just, no matter where they are in their spiritual journey, for some, this message, the resurrection, you're like, yes, and you understand the fullness of it. If that's you, may this be an encouragement as we focused on what Jesus did and who he is. For others that are that are wondering, that are thinking, that are doubting, that are questioning, that just aren't sure. May you use this message and this time together, your Holy Spirit, to confirm the reality of the truth, of the importance of the resurrection and what it means to us so that we can all take a step forward in our faith, not backward, so that we can live for you, not for ourselves, so that we can glorify you, God, in this body at this time. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. All right, get ready. It, it's, it's there. The sarcasm, it's, it's running deep. Let me be as sarcastic as Paul because without the resurrection, Christianity is a colossal waste of time. That, that's what it is. I mean, that's what Paul is saying. What we're doing here is foolishness. Take a look at what he says in verse 14. He says, but if there is no resurrection, skip down. He says, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. Let me double click on in vain. It means futile. It means worthless. It means in its original language, it means, honestly, in this context, it means foolishness. B because what we're doing is of no value. It's of no use. So what is of no value? What is of no use? What is futile? What is foolishness? What is stupid, if I can say it like that? Well, well, our preaching. So think about it. Every message that you ever heard, foolishness, futile, stupid, foolish. Every service you ever sat through, every Bible study that you ever went to, every growth group here at High Point, it's foolish, it's, it's a waste of time. Every Sunday school that you ever went to as a kid, the class, you sat there and you sat there. Now, some of you are thinking it was foolish and stupid. Stop that. But it wasn't a waste of time. And it wasn't foolish. And oh, maybe that person wasn't the most exciting and you got a little bored. I'll give you that. But it was not a waste of time. But that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, hey, if there's no resurrection, if Christ is not raised, then, then this is all a joke. I mean, I'll tell you, anybody loves summer in Chicago. Are we ready for it or not? I'm just like, oh, Lord, help me. I was in, um, Jody and I had the privilege of visiting um, Pastor Al, who many of you know at High Point St. Vincent, 80 degrees every day. Let that sink in, every day. Whether it's January, February, March, 80 degrees, it, it's really nice. And so we got a little prepped, and so I'm all excited today, and I drive in, and I see people like, you know, where I live, I'm, I'm seeing people running, and some people are out biking, and some people are out doing all these things, and it's Sunday, and I mean, that's great, but I'm thinking, without the resurrection, I would not be standing here in front of you. Anybody? I, I wouldn't be here. Our preaching is in vain. It would be foolishness. It's a waste of time. Like, well, what are we doing? Our preaching. My preaching. Preaching, I love this definition of it. It's truth communicated through personality. Here we see Paul's personality and, and that he's using sarcasm to prove his point. You, you get my personality, whether you like it or not, every week. And, and it's, it's truth communicated through person. This is a waste. But not only what I'm saying, but he also says, put the verse back up, please. He says, that, he says that our faith, specifically your faith. So he's talking about everything you ever believed in the Bible to be true, every truth that you ever practiced from the Bible, 
It's worthless, it's foolishness, it's stupid. Say it isn't so, can't be. But, but that's what he's saying. Paul's saying, put your thinking caps on, man. Like, like think this through because there was people who were questioning the resurrection. Let's get it in context. I know we were here last week in this passage, but what he's saying, and we're gonna see it in a moment, he's talking about a bodily resurrection. He's talking about your spirit and your body being united together in a glorified body. Christ is the first fruits. We'll see that in the end of the chapter. Christ is the first to be raised. Therefore, we will be raised. We will be raised to a glorified body. Those who are in Christ, your spirit and your physical body will be united again. That's what the scripture's teaching. And that's what Paul's saying. They had questions. Is this really true? And he's like, think about it. Yes, it is. Because Christ is the first fruits and he's the first to be raised. And so will you. And if not, then there's no resurrection. They're not preaching in this vain. Your faith is in vain. Second thought is this. Without the resurrection, all ministers are liars. They are all liars. He says it like this in verse 15. We're found to be misrepresenting truth. He says it. I am. He's saying the apostle Paul is a liar. He's saying all the ministers, the apostles are liars. All the missionaries are liars. Some versions say false witness. I think it's really important for us to understand what that means. Let me double click on it in the original language. Go ahead, put it up. That's what it means. Right there. That means every apostle, every minister, every missionary, every person who's ever shared the truth, that they're all misrepresenting God. They're all dirty, rotten, stinking liars. Charles Spurgeon, dirty, rotten, stinking liar. Mother Teresa, that girl was a dirty, rotten, stinking liar. How about this? I mean, I don't know, who's your favorite? Whatever it is, dirty, rotten, stinking liar. C.S. Lewis, dirty, rotten, stinking liar. Pastor Craig, dirty, rotten, stinking liar. That's what he is. Look, he admits it. I just wanted to say Craig's name with all those others. <laughs> Me. I, I'm a dirty, rotten, stinking liar. I mean, do, do you see how it's dripping with sarcasm? But, but he just wants us to think, and he wants us to understand. There's something about this passage that I really like, 1 Corinthians 15. I really like it because I kind of like sarcasm. And this is the biblical proof right here that it's okay. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, it's okay if your love language is sarcasm. I'm kind of kidding, but here Paul's saying it's true. And he's putting it in context that, man, we got to really think this through. And so we're not all dirty, rotten, stinking liars. That, that what? That, that there is a resurrection. And let me be clear, a bodily resurrection that's what we're believing. See, some people here back then were not believing it. We have the same tendency today. Well, it's just, no, it's Jesus' body was reunited, and he was what? He walked the earth. And 500 people saw it. We saw that last week. And I mean, think about that. I thought that was quite compelling when um, Ed was talking about this, and he mentioned the fact that you know, you think about 500 people at one time seeing something. And that's what we see in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and, he, and he made a comment and he said, you know, it's like, it's like if, if one person believes something and, and they say something, I mean, that's, that's one thing. And, and like Joseph Smith, he, he's the one guy who got this revelation from God. And I'm not trying to disparage anyone, but the one guy who believed the one thing and then everyone else believed him. Anybody see a little, a little skeptical on that? The one guy that got alone in his prayer closet and God told him to do something to change the world and everybody's following him and it's all different and he wrote it all down. I mean, here we're talking about 500 people who saw the resurrected Christ. 500 at once, they don't, they're crazy. It can't be a hallucination. They, they all saw it. Like, like that's proof of the resurrection. That, that, that firsthand eyewitness account right here in the scripture. 
satisfies all the tests for those who are thinking this through and want to study and research yourself. Do the research. I challenge you that, that what? That, that there's such great proof for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without it, I mean, just, we're just dial it in, man. We're wasting our time. Without it, I, I mean, it, Christianity, it, it, it's a joke. Without it, we're, 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 just, we're, just, we're just lying. And, and without it, how about the next thing? Not only this, and, and this is the one, this is the stake to the heart of the follower of Christ. Without the resurrection, forgiveness of sins is impossible. Like, like this, what we're talking about, and we're going to take communion today at the end of the service. I mean, I mean this is foolishness. Because without the resurrection, look what it says in the text. It says your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So that means you're sitting in it still. You're sitting in the mess, man, with the guilt and the shame. Hey, I don't care what you say. You got skeletons in your closet. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got them. You, you do. Now, I don't, I don't think you're going to admit it, but your neighbor's saying, what exactly are they? But, but we do. All of us, if, if we're honest. And so without, I mean, with, without the resurrection, then I'm stuck, man. I mean, redemption is a mirage. There's, there's no second chance. There's, there's no U-turn on the highway of life. There's no removing the guilt and shame of the foolish and stupid decision that I made. But with it, with it, there is forgiveness, if you believe in the resurrection. So, so let me give you my top five forgiveness verses. These are ones that I guarantee you've heard, but my challenge today is, do you know the address? And so Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, I'm betting you heard it, you're believing it. Many of us, we're feeling it, we've experienced it. If that's not you, you can experience it today. But what does it say? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They're, they're red as crimson. They shall be like wool. Anybody experience that? Come on, man. I mean, I'm not stuck in my sin. I, I'm not stuck in the path. Hey, my past is not an obstacle to me. It may be to some other people. It may be to a friend. It may be to a family member. It may even be to a pastor, but it is not to God. Why? B because of forgiveness. Because it's separated from the east to the west as far as you can. That's the next verse from Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Can we celebrate that this morning? <laughs> that there's forgiveness. So how do we know it? Well, the scriptures declare it. Psalm 86, 5, for you, O Lord, are good and you are forgiving and abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Hey, the work's been done. The ball's in your court. You don't have to walk around with the guilt and shame. Yes, there's going to be some consequences for that moronic thing that you did. But the guilt and the shame the backpack of sin, it's forgiven because of the gospel. It's forgiven because of Christ. Let us not forget that, that what? That the Bible talks about in the Old Testament sacrificial system, and for some this may be new. It's like, why, what do you mean? Why, why did someone have to die? Well, they, in the sacrificial system, what happened was that something had to die because Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So that lamb, that animal, had to be sacrificed. Blood had to be shed. Why? Because there's a cost to forgiveness. And so Jesus is the one that paid the price. Amen? Hebrews tells us that he's the once and for all sacrifice. That his sacrifice covers all. That, that once and for all, his blood was shed to forgive us, yes, praise the Lord, from our sin. And so what must we do? Well, let's get to the next one. Let's look at Colossians 1. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness, God has, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. That means we've been brought back and bought back for the forgiveness of sins. Next one is the important one, 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Not a little bit of unrighteousness. Not just a tiny bit. Not almost, but, but all. Meaning, if, if I go to him with a humble heart and if I confess the things that I've done, if there's some things that I can't quite recall, it, it's about my spirit and it's about my heart. And, and he's going to forgive us. Question, where would you be without the forgiveness of sin? But where would you be? And some of us were just like, I'd be dead. I'd be stuck. Paul's saying, that's the resurrection. So it's the linchpin. It's like that game Jenga. Have you ever played that game Jenga? And that game Jenga, like, it's like the, the, the unlucky person who pulls out the peg and it all comes tumbling down and you're holding it. That piece is the resurrection. Without it, everything comes tumbling down. So Paul says, without the resurrection, he says, and get ready for this one, he says, hey, we're all going to hell, man. That's basically it. We're going to hell in a handbasket. That's what's happening right now. That, that, that without the resurrection, nobody is going to heaven. We are all destined to H-E double hockey sticks. That's what he's saying. Look with me at the verse in verse 18. Those who have fallen asleep, that's a euphemism. That's a, that's a reference to death. Those who have died in this life, in Christ, that's the important part, have perished, meaning they will not go to heaven. They are destined to hell. That's what he's saying. He's making it crystal clear. So that means that that your grandmother, your parent who led you to Jesus, they're not in heaven, they're in hell. That, that person, that friend of yours who trusted Jesus and you modeled yourself after them, they helped you, they loved you, and, and you went to their funeral and you celebrated that they're in hell. I mean, do I need to be any more clear? You say, Ron, can you tone it down a little bit? I say, that's what Paul's saying. He, he's, he's like, put your thinking caps on, really think this through. But the Bible teaches, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, that, do you know this one? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I mean, that's a really important verse. Jot that down. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. That means that when I die in Christ, that means that what? That automatically, immediately, my spirit, not my body, that goes in the ground, or maybe it gets cremated, that, that what? That my spirit is with him. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. And then what he's teaching, and maybe for you it's review. If it is, who are you teaching it to? If you're a dad, you're the disciple of your family. If you're a mom, you're a disciple of your kids. If you're, if you're a friend, we've got to help everybody understand that, that, what? That, that our body and our spirit are reunited in a glorified body. That's what Paul's going to teach us next. And so, no, they're, they're not in hell. This isn't foolishness. We're, we're not a bunch of liars. But, but it all depends on the resurrection. That, that's the significance. And that's how important it is. And so lastly, I mean, get ready. He, he says, without the resurrection, all Christians are pathetic losers. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Point your neighbor and say, you're a pathetic loser. Just go ahead and do it. If it was, some of you were too quick to do that to your spouse. <laughs> Lord, help us. Ask for forgiveness right now. But, but it's... It, it, okay, so, so where is it in the text? Let's look at the verse. Verse 19 says, we're all people to be pitied. And so, so, so do, does anybody remember? There used to be this sign. You can't, let me just emphasize, you cannot do this anymore. Don't do this. There was a sign, though, about... It was a universal sign for a loser. Do you ever heard of that? I just told you, everybody, you can't do that. Are you calling me a loser? I mean, we're living, like, you can't, you know, but remember, it used to be, like, people used to go like this, you know, you just, like, I, I loved it. I, I went to, a, I'd go to a Hawks game, and I, I'd sit in there in the front, and, and then the people would be like this to the Hawks players. Hockey fans are weird, aren't they? They're just, there's something different. It's a little different for us basketball people, but let's, that's another story. So, so, so what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm saying that, that that decision that you made to follow Christ and that good work that you did in his name, you're a loser. That, that means that person that you have a heart for that you're witnessing to across the fence, you're a loser. 
That means and we watch the testimony of a baptism. We got a baptism in the next service. That means that person that's getting baptized is, is, is a loser. That means if you were baptized, you are a loser. You are a pathetic loser. I mean, are we getting the emphasis here? That means that mission trip you went to, you know what? You're a pathetic loser thinking you were going to help those people in the name of Christ. That means, I mean, that's what he's saying. That means every worship song that you have ever sung, pathetic loser. I mean, that's how important the resurrection is. Every service you ever went to, every good deed you ever did, every person I wanted to help, I, I mean, Paul's like, man, guys, you can't get this wrong. Like, there's a lot of things we can get wrong. <laughs> I mean, there's some truth you got to just grab hold of, and there's other truth, hey, we can debate, we can talk. But if you're talking about the resurrection, and you call yourself a Christian, like, it is the linchpin. It is everything. Without it, we got nothing. So how many are ready for some encouragement? Because yes. Paul turns it. So this is what I love about Paul, and this is what I'll say to you if you're a sarcastic person. Do you turn it? Because he's turning it. And look what he says in verse 20. I've got, I'm going to call these three transformational truths about what the resurrection, and the first one is that we have everlasting life. And so he says with the resurrection, look at verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. Boy, I just thought some, there'd be an eruption of applause. I was just thinking about that one. I thought, well, I'm going to read that. And people are just going to erupt and start applauding and, and stand to their feet. And, and you didn't. <laughs> but look, he says, with the resurrection, in fact, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So now he's getting theological on us, remember? I tried to kind of give us a little bit of this beforehand. The first fruits of those who've fallen asleep what does he mean by that? Well, look what he's talking about in verse 20. For, well, for as by one man death came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So who's that one man? What's he talking about? Death came. Well, because of Adam, it says in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So Adam is the first man, and because of his sin and Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, we have a sin problem, the depravity of man, that's the fall. And, and so, I mean, we've all sinned. And, and so he's saying because of that, it's been transferred to all. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. So all of us are sinners. There's a sin nature. There's a sin capacity that we all have. And it's because of Adam's sin. And then he says, well, but, but Christ is the first fruit, and he provides forgiveness of sin. And so just as Adam sinned, that was transferred to us, but just as Christ has been made alive, we can be made alive too. Verse 23 says, but each in his own order. So now he's getting real theological. Christ, the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. So he's saying Christ rose from the dead, bodily resurrection. That's the resurrection. That's what the 500 people saw. That was the glorified body. And he's saying that when he comes back, read Revelation chapter 21, new heaven, new earth, then we're going to have resurrected bodies. You say, what's that going to look like? I say, some of us are more excited about it than others. Truth there? That, that, but, but Jesus had some scars on his hands, and, and Jesus ate. We don't know much more than that. But you're going to probably have a few scars. You're probably going to eat, but there's going to be glorified body that what? We're going to be resurrected to new life. And that's because of the resurrection. And so again, Paul's getting into all of it. He just wants everybody to be clear. I want all of us to be clear. And then he says in verse 24, and this is the second, what I'm calling transformational truth, that the second truth is that with the resurrection we have eternal hope. And he says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Isn't that a great verse? And then and look what he says. He's going to conquer. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus is conquering death through the resurrection. He has conquered death for you and I. That's the importance of the resurrection. So the first truth is what? 
With it, we have everlasting life. The second transformational truth is this. We have hope. We have this hope, this eternal hope. I want to give you a couple quotes that I love. We're going to go back and go to these quotes that I love about the resurrection. The first one is from Clarence Hall. He says, the resurrection of Jesus changes the face of death for all his people. Isn't that interesting? He goes on to say, death is no longer a prison, but a passage into God's presence. Easter says you can put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. I love this. Look at this next from this great theologian. He says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven that, after all, is what the Lord's prayer is all about. So catch the significance. He's saying that it isn't about us going someplace, although that's going to be awesome. He's like, we're supposed to bring that place right here. So we're supposed to bring heaven into our families. We're supposed to bring heaven into our workplace. We're supposed to bring heaven into our schools, amen? We're supposed to bring heaven into our our communities and may I say even into our church that, that, that we're to bring heaven here on earth. And then lastly, I love this, Andrew Murray says it. This is a good one. Andrew Murray, he's the guy, he's the dependence guy, he's the abiding guy, he's the humility expert. Doesn't say he's the humility expert because that would lack humility. But he is. He's written a lot about it. I love what he says. A dead Christ I must do everything for. A living Christ does everything for me. Isn't that true? That's what we're celebrating. That's because of the resurrection. So lastly, we'll flash it up on the screen. We'll close with this. The resurrection, with it, we have fellowship with God. I mean, we have fellowship with him. And so let me read the verses to you. Paul, again, he turns and he goes a little, with a little more sarcasm. He says, otherwise, in verse 29, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the death? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? He says, why am I in danger every hour? He's like, he's like come on, I... I protest, brothers, but my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? He's just saying, I've given my life for this. It is true. And then look at the caution he gives to us. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And then verse 33, a very common verse that many of us know, but do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Guys, stop, stop walking around with a bunch of people who are doing a bunch of things, believing a bunch of things that aren't true. Look at verse 34. He goes after it, man, straight for the juggler. Wake up from your drunken stupor. This is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. I mean, do you you sense Paul's heart for the people and his desire for them to understand the significance of the resurrection? That he's like, he's he's pleading with us. Understand the significance. So in a moment, we're going to celebrate communion because there is a resurrection. And the resurrection resurrects us. And so I'm going to ask us to keep your Bibles open And the worship team is here. They're going to lead us. I'm going to ask us to stand with me, please. Pastor Craig's going to come up. I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's keep this attitude. Let's keep this humility. Pastor Craig's going to lead us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because without the resurrection, we have nothing. With the resurrection, we have everything. Please lead us, Craig.